Please turn with me in God's Word to the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. And we will remember that Isaiah chapter 6 comes in that first third part of the book of Isaiah, that first third, which is all about the news of persecution coming, of hardship, of God's discipline of His people, even the punishment of those who have lived ungodly lives and who are not really His people, although they have been circumcised. And so here, suddenly in Isaiah chapter 6, we hear Isaiah's calling and the reason why the Lord called him and what message the Lord gives him to give to the Lord's people. So Isaiah 6. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out. While the temple was filling with smoke, then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. And your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until cities are devastated and without inhabitants, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Yet there will be a tenth portion in it, and it will again be subject to burning like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. So a message of doom, which this poor prophet had to go and announce to God's people, a message of the enemy coming and destroying their country. Let us also turn now to the Creeds and Confessions booklet, where we page to page 108. And on page 108, we find in the right-hand column the modern English standard version of the Westminster Confession of Faiths article 5.5, 5.6, and 5.7. And so, let us read these. 
the most wise, righteous, and gracious God often leaves his own children for a time to manifold temptations and to the corruption of their own hearts. He does this to chastise them for their past sins, to humble them by making them aware of the hidden strength of the corruption and deceitfulness of their hearts, and to raise them to a closer, more constant dependence upon himself for their support, to make them more watchful against all future occasions for sinning and to fulfill various other just and holy purposes. And so this is God's judgment on his loved ones. But then the next uh, paragraph, paragraph 6, is about God's judgment on those who are not his loved ones. He says, as for those wicked and ungodly men whom God as a righteous judge blinds and hardens because of their past sins, God withholds his grace by which their minds might have been enlightened and their hearts affected. He also sometimes takes away the gifts which they had and exposes them to such things as their corrupt nature makes into occasions for sinning. Moreover, he gives them over to their own lusts, to the temptations of the world and the power of Satan, by which they harden themselves even under the same means which God uses to soften others. And then, in the third place, we come to paragraph 7, where God talk, where it's talking about God's providence for his church. As in general, the providence of God reaches to all creatures. So, in a very special way, it cares for his church and disposes all things for its good. Thus far, the readings from the Westminster Confession of Faith. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Westminster Confession of Faith's Article 5.5 to 5.7 reveals in a systematic way what God's Word says about His provision for three groups of people, for His loved ones, for the ungodly, and for the church. And so there are three points in this sermon. Here is then the first one, and it says, evil for good. Every earnest Christian has at times experienced the so-called dark night of the soul. You say, but what's that? Well, it's those seasons in the life of a Christian when it seems God has left you and has left you alone. Martin Luther often used to experience such seasons, especially when he was still thinking that the Christian himself has to earn his salvation. The Christian himself has to make him right with God. Of course, that was wrong. Also, King David used to experience such times as we can see from his cries in Psalm 143, verse 7, where he says, Answer me quickly, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, O Lord, or I will become like those who go down to the pit. Well, based upon this verse and many other Bible verses, because there are many, the Westminster Confessions 5.5 says, the most wise and righteous and gracious God often leaves his own dear children for a time, for a season, to manifold temptations and to the corruption 
of their own hearts. So someone might ask, but why would a God who is most gracious, wise, and righteous leave his own dear children in times of hardship? Yes, why is it so that God, whose Bible says he never tempts anyone, nevertheless at times allow for his loved ones to be tempted, to have their faith tested by some or other trial. Well, there are many reasons why God exposes you and me to suffering and at times leave us in our sin, or as the Westminster says, in the corruption of our own hearts. But herein lies great comfort, and that is that because we have been justified by grace, through faith alone, the ground for our eternal salvation remains secure. Not because of our own obedience, not because of our own righteousness, but because of the perfect righteousness earned for us by the Son of God, by Jesus Christ, whose act of saving cannot fail. And so the person who has truly received Jesus Christ as his Savior and as his Lord, such person need not fear eternal perdition, need not fear that he will be eternally lost, that he will or she will have fallen away from faith. Nevertheless, even though Christ's righteousness secures your and my eternal salvation. You and I are still sinners. Saved sinners, yet still sinners. And so in our daily walk with God, you and I are either pleasing to Him or displeasing to Him. And in this pilgrimage, this Christian walk of ours, we may so grieve the Holy Spirit in God the Father that He will chasten us. He will discipline us. But let's remember that God chastens and disciplines His own children not as final judge, but as tender father who exercises discipline. As the book of Hebrews 12 tells us, God disciplines those he loves. Indeed, as R.C. Sproul says so well, God may keep us on a long leash, letting us wander to a place where we feel far removed from him and where we are exposed to trials and temptations. Yet in our Lord's prayer, He, our Lord, taught us to pray. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so, what are we actually saying when we pray that petition? Well, are we not saying, please, Father, do for us what you did with Job and for Job. Please put a hedge around us. Yes, protect us to such a degree that even if and when we are tempted by the devil, that he will not totally destroy us or break our faith. My brother and sister, our Lord Jesus, when he was tempted in the desert, by the devil, as well as in Gethsemane, he had to withstand the full fiery darts of the devil. Well, pray that you and I will never be tempted by the devil in whatever way. Yes, that God will never expose you and me to severe hardship 
too heavy for us to bear. On the other hand, we must realize that God may do so if he thinks it is required for your and my further sanctification for our holy living. Indeed, part of God's providential care is to expose us from time to time. And so based upon the Bible, Article 5.5 says, the most wise, righteous, and gracious God often leaves his own children for a season. How long is that season? Well, for some, thankfully, by the grace of God, it is short. However, for others, it's several years of hardship of whatever kind, either because of a life-threatening illness or because of strain in their marriage or because of grief caused by children or because of extended periods of unemployment or because of persecution as for Pastor Wang Yi, or because of war, as for those Syrian Christians. The Westminster also reminds us that at times God leaves his children to manifold temptations and to the corruption of their own hearts. He leaves them to their own sins. My brother and sister, it's so natural to assume that God's disciplining of his loved ones is because of some specific sin which they have committed. Well, that's how the disciples and the Pharisees thought about the man who had been born blind, John chapter 9. They had one of two options in mind. It was either he who sinned, or his parents. But Christ revealed to them there's a third option. It was not that this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So at times, it's not because of your and my sin that God disciplines us but for his eternal purposes, which may be unknown to you and me. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. The things revealed are to us, but the hidden things are to God. Thus, as with the man born blind, and as with Job, God's discipline of us is not always because of our sins or because of a specific sin. However, you and I must now not jump to the conclusion that our suffering is never related to our sin. For God may, of course, still discipline the saved sinner for his sins. And so... What should we then do when we suffer hardship or trial or when we're going through the dark night of the soul? Well, firstly, you and I must remember and we must keep on trusting that God in his providence has sent us this hardship and that God is good. Then, we must ask secondly, Lord, what do you have in mind? And wait on the Lord. Thirdly, we need to examine ourselves to see whether we have not perhaps grieved the Lord in some or other way. If so, we need to acknowledge and confess that. We need to ask God to forgive us. Yet, at times you hear people say, and we have talked about it in our men's breakfast as well one day, 
But Christ has then died for my sins. So surely God is now not punishing me for my sins. Now we talk that God does not punish his loved ones. He only disciplines them. Yes, that's true. But let us remember the fact that Christ has taken our punitive wrath does not prevent you and me from experiencing God's corrective wrath. God may not punish his loved ones, but he will still send them hardship at times to correct them. My brother and sister, the Westminster talks about this very fact when it says God does this to humble them by making them aware of the hidden strength of the corruption and deceitfulness of their hearts. Well, let us not fool ourselves. Let's not kid ourselves. The human heart, and that's also your and my heart, even though we are Christians, is full of deceitfulness. The Bible says is deceitful above all things. Jeremiah 17. And so R.C. Sproul hits the nail on the head when he says, not one of us has begun to grasp the full extent and the gravity of our own transgressions. We tend to give ourselves the highest possible approval rating and our enemies the lowest. We see every piccadillo, every little sin that they commit as evidence of their despicable corruption. We see the splinter in them. But we are guilty of having the log in our own eyes. So sometimes God says, like it or not, you are going to see that log because I'm going to step aside here and remove my blessings from you until you see that log in your eye. And so in this manner, God guides you and me and every loved one of him in their Christian walk, yes, in their sanctification. And I love what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13, where he focuses on what you and I do in our Christian walk and what the Lord does. And actually, what we do is, is, is protected and guided and steered by what he does. It says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Work out your own salvation. See that you follow on the path of sanctification. You're not making yourself to be right with God. This is just meaning you are already saved. But your salvation needs to be finished on the day that you die. So on this path, from your regeneration till your dying day, work at it. Work at your salvation, knowing that it is God who works in you. My brother and sister and young person, would you like to know what God wants from you and from me? He wants us to be holy, to be conformed to the image of his Son. That should be our chief concern in life. We come to point two, Point one was evil for good. Point two is good for evil. As for the ungodly, and that is people who never received Jesus Christ, God's love gift, 
God withholds His grace by which their minds could otherwise perhaps have become enlightened and their hearts have been warmed for God. Yes, at times, God exposes the ungodly to the same trials that He allows for His loved ones. However, whereas these trials would work repentance and love for God in the hearts of God's loved ones, these same trials harden the heart of the ungodly even more. Yes, you hear the gospel and it softens your heart. But your neighbor who hates the gospel hears it and responds with even more enmity and animosity than before. So one could in a sense say that that which works for the good of God's loved ones works for even more evil in the ungodly. From there, then, the title to this point in the sermon, good or evil. So God gives people over to Satan to be exposed to his manifold temptation. And God does this, uh, and, and God does not just allow these things, but God positively ordains these things. And God's punishment on corrupt people is just. God not only subjects them to further temptations, but He actually also hardens their hearts and He blinds them as God did with Pharaoh. Then after imposing these punishments, God further punishes them for their godlessness. In Isaiah 6, our Old Testament passage, we have a clear example of this. God's people, not everyone, we must remember in, in God's covenant people, were, or was God's people. It's still the same. Not everyone in the church is really a God's loved one. And so, because of the sins of God's people, he says, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and make their ears heavy, and make their eyes blind, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. So Isaiah's mission was one of hardening the people. God declared that he would make their eyes blind. He would make their ears deaf and their hearts fat, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. So what do we see? We see that God took an active role in preventing these corrupt people from repenting and being restored. Yes, I agree. It's hard for you and me to understand. But our Lord Jesus did the same. You know, he taught in parables. Why did he do that? Why did he not speak plainly? Well, so that those who were supposed to hear would hear. And those who were not supposed to hear would not understand and would not hear. So these stories or parables of our Lord had a double function, like a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it gave clarity, and on the other hand, it was to hide his teaching from those who are not God's chosen. God does this. God does this as an act of judgment. It's one thing to hear and another thing to heed. You can hear the order from a policeman, from your teacher, from your boss, or you, even from God, and you can fail 
to heed it. Obedience comes when the message you hear grabs hold of you, grabs hold of your will, and you respond with obedience. That's like when God's word is preached and the chosen one of God receives that inward gospel call. My brother and sister, God's punishment of the ungodly for their sin comes in a way as the so-called poetic justice, as just deserts, which simply gives people over to their own sinful desires. And how frightening. In the final judgment, God will say to the wicked, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. Revelation 22. And so in God's disciplining of the ungodly, it says if he says to them, well, if that's what you want, then my spirit will not fight with you. I will not restrain you, but rather I will withdraw from you my presence and my grace and let you do exactly what you desire, which is altogether wicked. My brother and sister and young person, when God abandons people, he abandons them to themselves. Yes, it's not as if God is taking away their own free will and is now making decisions for them. No, God simply delivers them over to their own free will by which they themselves then choose to do the evil desires of their hearts. Through Isaiah, God is saying to the ungodly among Israel, if you don't want to hear me, I will take your hearing away. If you don't want to see me, I will take your sight of holy things away. If you don't want to give me your heart with affection, I will turn your heart into stone. You know what? The Bible tells us that at the core of man's natural state, also ours is a heart of stone with respect to the things of God. We don't want to hear or see him. And we don't want to respond to him affectionately and positively. Well, as part of his judgment, God gives the ungodly, his non-elect, what they want. Yes, as 5.6 says in the Westminster, he gives them over, firstly, to their own lusts, secondly, to the temptations of the world, and thirdly, to the power of Satan, by which they harden themselves even under the same means which God uses to soften others. Wow. It's as if one can so clearly see this happening in our day and age. God has given them over. Well, people react in two different ways to the gospel. 2 Corinthians 4 says, And even if our gospel it is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. My brother and sister and young person, may you and I never reach the stage where the ungodly are. The stage where we have lost the ability to blush and to be ashamed of our sin. Or to put it in Jeremiah's words, Jeremiah 3 verse 3, may you and I never have a prostitute's forehead, the forehead which cannot blush anymore. We come to the last small point, his care for the church. 
throughout all of world history, my brother and sister, from Adam until now, God's special providence has guided and protected His church. Yes, His elect. Indeed, even at times when there was only a small remnant of the church, like in the days of Noah, in the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or as in the days of Elijah when he cried out, Lord, they have killed all your prophets and I am the only one left. And then God replied, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way, God's special providence guided the early church through all her hard struggles against false teachers and false teachings. Also through the formation of the canon when it had to be decided which books were truly God's word and needed to be included in the canon and which books not. Then God also guided his true church through times when the church, Christendom as they called it, before it was called the Roman Catholic Church, had left the pure gospel of Christ. Yes, God kept his church through the Reformation. And still now, God has kept a remnant of true believers, despite the powerful sins of liberalism in the late 1800s, even in New Zealand, even at the then Knox College. God has kept his church even now in the age of post postmodernism. And thus you and I can be optimists if we believe in God's special providence for his church and in Christ's lordship over his church. I mean, did our Lord not say, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. My brother and sister, hear God's word for you and me amidst all our trials and temptations. This word comes to us from Isaiah 43, where it says, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Amen.